years old. I work as a senior backend engineer for Federal Plane, which is a Dutch startup company, roughly 18, 15 people. And our speciality is if you imagine Google Docs and Jupyter Notebook, but for root cause analysis, figuring out why is my infrastructure down, we have an interactive notebook or collaborative notebook where you can query your infrastructure, get your metrics and your logs into a collaborative notebook so that even asynchronous teams can work together and figure out what's on going on with your infrastructure, like if your services are down or whatever. Um, so in relation to that, uh, we use Wasm quite a lot. So therefore, it makes sense for me to have a talk about Wasm and one of the tools we have developed in relation to this. So to begin with, I'll give you all an overview of what we're going to be talking about. First, I'll give a high-level introduction to what Wasm actually is. Um, maybe people can have a show of hand how many people are familiar with it. OK, so quite a few half-ish. That's quite good. <laughs> um, after that, I'll dive into some more details about how does Wasm work, how does Wasm modules look, both on a binary and a text representation level, and then uh, talk about how those primitives build up to something we can actually interact with, and then how at Fire Plane we have built a tool to interact with the Wasm, not just in the browser, but also server side in various other ways. And then I'll show some example code of how that uh, generated output basically looks and how it works in more details. And then finally, we'll end off with uh, some questions and answers, hopefully. So, Wasm, what is Wasm? Well, it means WebAssembly, but it's not really web, and it's not really assembly either, so. <laughs> but uh, in basic, uh, WebAssembly is a simple virtual machine, so it's an instruction uh, set that is both fast to parse, uh, fast to compile or JIT or whatever way you want to execute it. Um, it's a stack-based machine, meaning that you don't pass in arguments to operands, et cetera, et cetera. It's just the last X. Uh, values that you have on your stack that the uh, instruction takes as argument, basically. Um, it's also meant to be portable, so sort of fulfilling what Java wrote as their idea, saying run everywhere, compile once, but never really came to fruition, depending on who you ask. Uh, it's also meant to be sandboxed, so meant to be secure. Um, and some of the history, like why it came to be, is that basically JavaScript sucks, everyone hates it. So we decided, okay, we actually want to be able to compile something to a web target. Um, and before that even, there was this ASM.js, which was not really assembly and not really JavaScript either, but some bastardization <laughs> that no one liked either. Um, so after a while, this whole Wasm thing came to fruition, and now there's quite broad industry support for it. Uh, so all modern browsers support it as a target. Um, there also vary as host runtime, so for Rust, there's something called Wasmer and Wasm Time that can actually use either LVM or various compilers to compile these Wasm modules into native code that you then can execute. Um, so, Wasm, what do I care? Um, well, like we talked about, there are some security implications. Uh, for example, in the browser, it makes sense that the thing is completely isolated. So it does not have access to your file system or whatever. Everything that it actually access has to be specifically imported or exported as function definitions, basically, from it. So it has a very coarse security model. Um, in relation to running it in the browser, you also have the benefit of performance, in some cases, at least. Um, of course, you have some marshalling overhead by going from JavaScript context to a Wasm context and back and forth. But once you're actually in Wasm, there is possibility to actually reach near native speeds because, well, depending on your language, you might be running a native language. Um, and the browser also has the possibility to JIT the Wasm code into native executable code and run really fast. Um, some more modern proposals also uh, give SIMD access from Wasm, further speeding up stuff. Um, so that's the performance security. Then plugins. So in the Rust context, there is not a stable ABI. So you cannot easily just um, dynamically import Rust modules and start working together with them. For example, if you're developing a game and want some modability or expandability or 
uh, have your users expand your interface with some plugins of some sort is not really doable in Rust. So this is another use case for Wasm where you will actually uh, define an interface with Wasm and then people can compile whatever language they have as long as they fulfill the interface specification uh, and you can import those modules, compile them or JIT them, whatever you prefer um, to actually run it in your uh, program in a secure sandbox way so that, again, uh, can't be malicious code or whatever, but you can easily interact with it and have fairly reasonable performance. Um, this also, for example, in games, this has been done previously with the uh, Lua JIT, um, another runtime, but that's very C and C++ focused, where people would write uh, plugins for games in Lua. So if you're familiar with World of Warcraft, that's how plugins work in that game. Like you can submit arbitrary plugins and basically run it inside your game to modify the interface and provide various features. Um, it's heavily used. Um, so a bunch of games do that, but an alternative for that is awesome. Um, another example, so for example, the reason that we started going down this path at uh, Fiberplane is that we have some code that we need to share between the front end and the back end. So, because we're doing a collaborative notebook, we are using operational transform. It is sort of a distributed data structure where you are applying some operations to a data structure and then they can go in arbitrary orders and still manage to synchronize. Even though the client might be offline for a bit, server is offline, it can all synchronize back up uh, in a nice way. But the problem is that the transforms have to be implemented exactly the same. If there's just a minor divergence, the thing basically doesn't work. So, in that case, we actually ended up writing all our transformation code in Rust, and then we can compile that to WebAssembly to run it in our front end where we need it for the client, but we can also run the same transformations on the back end as native Rust code. Another benefit, again, is hot reloading. For example, in the game case that oh, you might be changing some logic of the game or some uh, enemy behavior or character behavior, whatever, you're able to basically just compile that section of the behavior and reload your Wasm module. And you have new function pointers essentially that you can call into in a good way um, to get uh, faster instead of having to reboot your game every time. So what now? Well, as described, Wasm is basically just a virtual machine, but there's no input or output or display or anything you can easily talk to. So the way that all of the interaction with Wasm works is that you need to call functions on the virtual machine and that gives us some complications. So before we dive into this complication, let's talk a little bit more about how Wasm looks and what what in the... Like this is binary, nobody really understands. If you do, I'm very impressed at least. Um, so this is not really the greatest representation for people. So. There's this uh, sort of disassembled version specifying what is this? Okay, we start the module with some magic to say, oh, this file type. Then we have what binary version of Wasm it is. So far, there's only one version, so it doesn't matter much. Then there's a whole bunch of section specification, blah, 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 blah. No one really understands. Well, hopefully, someone does, but I don't. <laughs> so we have what is something instead, which is WebAssembly text, um, hence the name. Uh, which uh, the 70s called, they want their list back. <laughs> but uh, apparently web developers were too cool for uh, AT&T syntax. Uh, so my background is in embedded software. So I'm familiar with low-level assembly, but this is not really assembly. Uh, but uh, again, this is a stack-based machine. And you can see here we're specifying a module that has a function called add with a left-hand parameter and a right-hand side parameter. And that has an i32 result, and the parameter is also i32. And we can see we have a local.get uh, for both arguments, which then goes into the add instruction. So here you can really see how it's actually stack based. We're not providing any parameters to add, but it just takes the two most recent values off the stack and then outputs a value to the stack as well, which the return result is also the last value on the stack. And this is where we came from in terms of Rust. I mean, we are at a Rust talk. You have to also have to show some Rust code, at least. <laughs> it's basically just a very simple hash function. Hopefully, we're all familiar with that. So yeah, what does a Wasm module look like on a basic uh, level? Well, 
we have a whole bunch of section. We have code, which is basically the bodies of the function, but not the function signature itself that lives elsewhere, namely in the function section where we're basically having a mapping from a name to a function signature. But the function signature doesn't live there directly either. It lives in the type section. Now, the type section is not what you might think of as how you're defining your structs or integers or whatever type aliases you might have. It doesn't live there. It has nothing to do with that at all. It's actually just a function definition table saying, okay, I have a type T1 and that type T1 takes X arguments of primitive types and returns another type. So it's basically just the function definition living there. Why exactly is done like that? I don't know, but serves some reuse between the different functions, I guess, if you have multiple of the same definition. Um, then you have imports and you have exports. This is what we're going to be talking more about in detail today. Um, so these are basically tables mapping external names to internal function names. Again, referring to the function table. Yeah, so that goes both ways, and that way um, the runtime can look up what are the function types of the imported and exported um, types. And then we have the memory section, which uh, at current date is quite useless, so it's part of the specification, but there's only allowance for one memory, which is your global memory. There's some plans from what I understand down in the future to be able to link multiple memory sections into a virtual machine um, for various reasons. Um, but yeah, currently it's not very useful. It's basically just the runtime will say, okay, this Watson program have this much memory to uh, work with. And then you have your global uh, section, which is like global variables. This can be static data or it can be const data, basically. Um, there's more sections, but eh, not really. Yeah. yeah. Does that mean a Watson module will always have a fixed amount of memory? No. So, this depends heavily on the runtime. So for example, in a browser context, I've, I'm not sure you can even limit it there. There it just has access to the browser memory more or less, not directly, but the same amount of memory as the browser. So it would allocate, I guess, um, for uh, Wasmer, the Rust runtime, or one of the Rust runtimes for it, there you can limit how much memory you have. It will start out basically nothing and then allocate more as it is required. It's, it's more or less just a reference to a memory area. This is what that memory section does. It's not encoded into the Watson module how much memory it needs or how much it's allowed to have that is set elsewhere. Then we have the code module. Um, yeah, so in more detail, this is the actual assembly code, so to speak. So these are the function bodies they live here. Um, and here, is sort of where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, in the sense that we only have primitive assembly instructions. So we can add, subtract, we can do various branching logic, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we cannot operate on anything in terms of complex. But fortunately, it's not something we have to deal with because this is the compiler's job. So the compiler will translate, oh, we have this struct that means we need to add offset from this on the stack or whatever, if we have a struct on the stack. Um, so that's fortunately not something we have to do. Um, it also encodes the instruction to access both local and global variables and load them into a stack so that we can operate on them. Uh, and the same for loading uh, from memory. It loads into their local variables and then from there you can operate on the stack. Uh, so how does this look in more practice? Um, so if we ignore all tooling and just do it, everything ourselves in Rust, uh, this is how it would look to actually import a function inside of Rust. So we have to say, okay, we're linking this Wasm import module. We have to specify what namespace in Wasm world or from the host that this is coming from. So now we're inside the virtual machine. So we're specifying an external C function here. And you can see we only have access to uh, primitive types. So I cannot pass a string into this function directly. That won't work because we're using the C ABI application binary interface. If we compile this Rust code uh, and not optimize it out, we will get some uh, WebAssembly text that looks like this below here. Uh, so we can see we're importing from some namespace a function called var, and that function inside our world has a sum mangled name that takes a type t1, and then the instruction to actually call that external function is just call a 
and then that song main is main. Uh, so this is a bunch of uh, hex characters and maybe some part of the import path and stuff. It's up to the compiler exactly what it does there. As for the type, I'll talk a little bit more about that there. Um, so for exports, so this is functions that the host can access inside the guest. We only need to specify that the function is no mangle. Then the compiler will take care of the rest, saying that this is an external uh, C function, essentially. Um, and what that compiles down to is here, for example, we have a type T12 that says the type is a function that just returns a result I32. If it took an argument, that would be between func and result. So it could be parameters and then arg and some uh, type like youth64 or whatever. And then we also have the function table here, which says we have a function foo with a type T12, which we specified above, that returns a result I32. But it's sort of duplicated. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and then last but not least, we say we export a function under the name foo that references the function foo internally. But those names don't have to match up exactly. It's a mapping, essentially. Now, now we get to the core of the problem, basically, that we don't have a way to pass external or complex information in and out of WASM world. Um, because we can only work with U64 or floats or integers, basically, on some integers. Um, there's not really a, a way that you can just pass arbitrary bytes in, or you can pass in an array or string, or whatever complex data structure you have. So what do we do about this? Can we pass a pointer in? I mean, a pointer can fit in a U64. Well, not really, because the problem is that the host is isolated, so it can't, uh, sorry, the virtual machine is isolated. So the pointer you would pass in is in the host, but the guest or the virtual machine can't access out here. It only has access to its own isolated memory area. So that won't work. Well, what about heap allocation? Well, that's sort of the same thing. You know, we can't pass the pointer in here. So um, a third problem is that the Watson world, since it's a Watson module, that might have been compiled from any language. It just has to sort of fulfill that C API of the exported functions. So this could be a Go program, or it could be a Rust program, but there's no common type between those two, like how, how uh, complex structs are laid out in memory. So one solution to this problem is that, okay, we know we can return primitives from functions. So what the Watson bind gen does here, for example, is that it say, okay, we're not gonna pass complex data out of the Watson world, we're gonna keep it all inside Watson. And then in order to interact with it, you have to define getters and setters on your structs and basically have a global singleton to some extent uh, in your code. Or you can say, I will accept handles, like a Rust cell function that takes self, right? That's a pointer to itself. And then it can operate on that and then you can return a primitive to that. Then you have a getter uh, if you have some primitive field in your struct. But we still can't have a getter on a string easily. So one way to solve that problem is that we can pass both strings and slices, we can return them as fat pointers, so to speak, means it's a pointer plus a length. And since WASM is limited to 32-bit address space at the moment, we can sort of abuse that fact by cobbling together a U32 pointer and a U32 length, then that can handle all pointers inside WASM world. We can return that as a U64, basically just splice them together, and then pass that back and forth saying, okay, now the host knows that there is this much data at this location in the guest area, the guest memory area. But the host, of course, has access to the guest, but not the other way around. So the host can go into the guest memory, copy the data out in whatever format it needs. In Rust, it's quite easy. If you do Rust on both sides, then the formats are compatible, right? As long as they're compiled on the same compiler version at least, <laughs> and you stick your head in the sand. Um, but this only really solves the problem of returning data, right? Because we also need to figure out where we put that data if we want to uh, put a complex type into the Watson world. So then we can't just take an arbitrary place in the guest memory or virtual machine memory and put something there because the allocator inside the virtual machine might decide, hey, that's my memory now. I'm going to put something else there. Um, and then you're screwed, right? So we instead need to actually export the malloc and free functions 
which informed the global allocator inside of the uh, guest about, okay, we would like this much memory, and then it tells you, okay, here's the memory, then we get that out of the guest. On the host side, we can then copy the data into that location. Then we can take that pointer and give it to the guest again, saying, here, you can access your data there. And then once we're done with this whole uh, dance, we can then free the memory finally from the host. Uh, so yeah, that is quite uh, quite the struggle. And as I said, this is what Weiss, Was and Bindgen does. Um, but Was and Bindgen, so for people who don't know, is basically some tooling that enables you to run Was and modules uh, built in Rust, where you annotate your functions and types with a prop macro, and then it, that will and when you do Wasm pack, we'll generate a whole bunch of TypeScript or JavaScript files that specifies how you can interact with the Wasm module that you're loading. Yeah. And that works really well for a browser context, but there are situations where you want to run Wasm outside the browser. So what exactly do we do here, especially in the context of wanting to run arbitrary uh, languages compiled to Wasm? That's where solution number two comes in. So basically, we will sort the world. <laughs> so we'll uh, use our good old friend serialization using the word library sorting. Um, and then we'll use the same technique where we go and allocate a buffer inside the guest. Then we copy our serialized data into there. And then we call the function with that pointer to that data. The function will then know based on its signature, hey, I need to deserialize this type from that location. Then it goes and do that. And then it can call the original code that the user wrote inside of the plugin. Um, so again, this is using the vampire pointer concept with the pointer and the length. Um, and we basically convert it to a UA slice, like an arbitrary data, deserialize it. Um, and then, of course, we need to reverse that process for the return type if it's complex. So if you're returning a struct, we need to allocate a buffer for it. We need to serialize into that buffer, return the pointer, and then when the host is done with that, it will have to go back into the guest and free that, assuming you want to call in the same memory space again. Right? So you don't want to write this by hand, and that's where a combined jump comes in. Um, so as a comparison to Watson Bindgen, that only works for basically TypeScript and uh, Rust, FP bindgen sort of nails down the specification of how these fat pointers look and uh, what serialization format is, etc. And then FP bindgen itself is just a, a support library and a code generator that you run. Using that library, you can specify a protocol. That protocol says that, okay, there must be these functions that are imported and these functions that are exported. So that will sort of be figured out at runtime by the host, uh, if these functions exist in the module, and if not, it'll fail to load the module, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it will basically uh, be able to generate three types of code for you. Uh, so a, a TypeScript runtime at present. So that is if you want to call the Wasm module from your browser. It will run generate a Rust runtime using Wasmer. So it basically solves all of the Rust code for you with allocating memory and compiling a Wasm module. You just give it a blog of a Wasm, of your Wasm module that you load off the file system, for example, give it to that, and then you have a nice object or struct that you can call the guest functions on and get the data out. It will do all the serialization and deserialization for you in a nice way. Um, and we ended up using message pack as the serialization data type here. Um, that is mainly because it's a binary format, but it's also not an um, as strict as other binary formats in the sense that it's easier to actually expand. Say, for example, your protocol evolves over time, you'll have some fields that are optional um, in the future, then you can easily add that and uh, certainly can default those fields out. So even if an older version uh, of the Wasm module doesn't expect them, it can still deserialize it or serialize it back and so forth. So how does this look actually? Um, so you will make your own protocol crate, and in that crate, you basically say FP export, you put your function signatures inside that one. So those are the ones that the uh, virtual machine will export to you that you can access from the host. And then import is the functions that you are saying that the guest will have access to. And then we basically call another macro with some configuration I've omitted here, 
but that basically just sets up where you want the finals output to and, and some configuration options for them. So what does this actually generate? Generate a binding scrape. So for the exported foo function that returns a string, uh, we basically output this stuff in the crate, uh, and also for the imports so on two separate files, and generates a nice crate for you. And what does these uh, proc macro annotations do? Well, here's a little bit of magic for you. Um, so first for the bar, so again, this is the imported function. You can see we basically generate the code we talked about earlier. So we're importing from the FP namespace. We know we have an FP gen bar function. And then for the guest itself, we make a nice little helper that takes care of the unsafe and uh, name mangling of it. So the guest can basically just call bar inside itself as if it's normal Rust code. It doesn't have to care about anything. Naturally, this is a very simple example because it doesn't export or import any complex data or any types at all, right? It's just a void function. But foo is the exported function. So this is the one that we want to write in our WASM module. And this one starts becoming a little bit more complex. And so the exported signature basically handles this foo function where we give it a function pointer to a function that returns a string. And then this thing returns a fat pointer. And we call the function pointer with no arguments in this case, and then we export the return value of that function pointer execution to the host. So this basically handles all the serialization and deserialization and converts it to a fat pointer. But how is that actually used? So this foo function is the one that the user or the developer of the Watson module is actually writing him or herself. Um, so we see we mark it by f export impl. We say this is from the example bindings crate. So this is one of the things you configure for the um, FP bind gen in the protocol crate, saying, okay, what's the name of this crate actually? And that means we can even implement multiple protocols in the same WASM module so we can support uh, new versions or whatever have you. Maybe you'll have a plugin that makes sense to export for multiple things, different protocols. Uh, but you just Right, that's completely normal Rust code. You don't have to take care of anything here. It handles everything. But this proc macro here generates this code. So you see, we still have our normal foo function at the bottom, which was the user wrote. But up above, we generate the actual non-mangled function. This one then calls into example bindings, calls the foo function with foo. It's a little bit confusing naming. But that basically passes the function pointer into that uh, function which executes it. The reason this is done like this is because proc macros in Rust don't actually give you access to type checking and so forth, but by doing this, we sort of abuse the function pointer to do the type checking for us. So if the user decides, oh, my foo function here should have an argument of another string, then this will actually fail at compile time now um, because the function pointer signature won't match up. So you don't need to worry about this as a user, but it's helpful in terms of actually getting proper error reporting when you're developing. What does it look like on the runtime then? Um, so this is part of a bigger struct implementation for the actual runtime. There's some support stuff and actually compiling the Watson module that we generate. Um, but basically we define a foo function that takes self, so that is the Watson uh, host environment, like the memory it has allocated and various things. Uh, so that you can actually reuse the same module, uh, same memory area, and call it into the Wasm module multiple times. Um, and here, this is then using the Wasmer library. So we basically have an instance with some exports. We can get a native function. In this case, it's actually a little bit wrong. I can see it shouldn't have the first fat pointer. It should just be parentheses uh, because there's no arguments. Um, anyway. Basically, uh, the generics there specify what is the function, native function signature of the Wasm module's foo implementation. And then we can map the error. Then we have a function we can call with some arguments. We don't actually have any arguments in this case. And then finally, we have a return, a result value. So this is our fat pointer, which we then will say import from guest using our environment and the result. So that basically does all the deserialization and gives us a native data type. Uh, in this case, a string here. 
Um, and then in the Rust, uh, there's not Rust runtime code, there's the TypeScript runtime code. That's all here. Um, also, again, there's a lot of support code and generated code all around this. But we basically define that we have some export with a function foo that might be null that returns a string. And then we return an object that specifies all this, gets the right export, and then uh, returns a uh, closure, which does all the object parsing of the exported fn and so on and so forth. So basically the same thing as the Rust side was doing with the serialization and deserialization. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? So what's what's uh, in an environment? You just have to set E and E um, to get some errors. Yeah. So the environment is the Wasmer environment in this case. So that environment uh, contains both the memory, but also the from the host perspective exported function, but from the guest side's imported function. You basically need to set up an import map that says, okay, this Wasm module has access to these imported functions. Um, so that's contained in that environment. So you mentioned you uh, ended up using message pack for, yeah. the, for the format. Did you, uh, it sounded like you tried other stuff? Um, maybe um, like protobufs, whatever? So that decision was made before I joined the company. Uh, so I'm not familiar with whether we did any benchmarking or stuff. Uh, I'm not entirely happy with the message pack choice, but uh, it's, n it's not that hard to switch it out if you intend to do that. I think something like bin code uh, might be more optimal for it because it's a binary format that's meant to have a low size. The less memory you have to copy back and forth, I think it would be better. But you end up losing out compatibility between different protocol versions. Imagine you have an imported, or a, yeah, an imported function that returns a complex struct. That complex struct in the old version of the protocol was just two string fields. Then you add a third string field what now? Then the host, when it calls the Wasm world, will get two string fields and missing one. You can do a 30 default on it, and then it will still work. But that doesn't always work with some of these other serialization formats when they're not self-descriptive, basically, when you don't have the field names in there. Yeah, a bit similar to that. So I guess if you're having a lot of Wasm modules that are then starting to interact with each other, the the part that's going to be very time consuming is all of this serialization and deserialization. So do you have some way of, like, I don't know, some best practices for how you should build your Wasm module or how you interact with each other so you uh, have as few uh, cross boundary communications as possible? Yeah, so you sort of end up with the trade off there, right? So, first of all, you can pass the simple types, primitives in and out very fast. That's not an issue at all. It's more when you need to do the deserialization and serialization, like you mentioned, because there's multiple calls back and forth for malloking and freeing and serialization, blah, blah, blah. Now, sort of what we've come to the conclusion is that it's best to keep as much of the state in Rust or in the Wasm module as possible so that you keep the state there and then you interact with it. You say, like, hey, please apply this update to the state. Um, so if people are familiar with React and Redux, we actually keep our Redux state in Wasm, uh, partially, to do stuff there. Um, but that, of course, has the trade-off. Then you need to do more calls for a bunch of updates, right? Versus like doing uh, computationally intensive things where you pass in some arguments and some data, do a lot of computation, and then you pass the result back. Then the cost of doing that is not so much. It's more if you do a lot of function calls, so it is very much a trade-off uh, that is very dependent on your use case, I feel. You have a question? And how do you handle failures as when the code running in Slack works and the crashes, let's say? How yeah. is that reflected in the Rust side? Yeah, so that is handled by the runtime, basically. So Wasm has the concept of traps, basically. So that would be if you call panic or unwrap or whatever it fails then you will actually have that bubble up all the way to the runtime host, uh, the host runtime. And in Wasmer, at least uh, the specific library we use, it will give you an invocation error. And it will tell you like, oh, okay, 
the instruction at offset whatever failed, but you don't get a nice stack trace out of it. So there's a whole bunch of not so nice things here for debugging and stuff. Uh, yeah. So it's one solo, and somebody do something with Fasm where they had this image in a big array, and they wanted to, I think it was rotated by 90 degrees or whatever, and they wanted to do this with Wasm, like from JavaScript. And so what they did, they didn't use Rust, they used some sort of very primitive language where you didn't have like dynamic allocations, you could just like, oh, access the shared memory allocation 0 or 10 or whatever. Yeah. And then they just directly accessed it from location 0 and so forth, instead of having all sorts of data and free calls. And that seemed, well, you throw away your ability to do dynamic allocations, but it, it also gives you some advantages in that you avoid all of the malloc and free calls yeah. over the boundary. Is yeah. that kind of stuff possible at all to write in Rust? Yes, so this is what a Wasm bind gen does. So the specific insight there is that the browser runtime does not isolate the memory space between JavaScript and Wasm. So that's why you directly inside of the Wasm can actually access the memory of the JavaScript runtime. Yeah, I think you can pass like a shift back and a repo. Yeah, something like that. But there, there is some easy sharing there that avoids some of this uh, memory allocation, as far as I understand. I'm not so much into details. I'm a backend guy. <laughs> I run away when I see front end. Uh, this Wasm that you mentioned, you were running that in the backend. So you're running Wasm modules in the backend as well. It's not just Rust code compiled. That's we do both. Um, so that is specifically because, again, we are a collaborative notebook, and we need to get data from your infrastructure into those notebooks. But people don't want to expose their database or a log, uh, Elastic Log or Prometheus or whatever you have to store your uh, metrics and logs. They don't want to put it on the internet for obvious reasons. So we have what we call relay and proxy. So proxy runs Wasm modules in your cluster or hard soft uh, sort of server infrastructure, and it runs, for example, an Elastic uh, uh, Log plugin that you then give a configuration saying, "Hey, you can access Elastic Log on this." Uh, IP address. And then our protocol says, yeah, okay, uh, you can do an HTTP request from inside the Wasm module. We've implemented the serialization of elastic log structures and pass it over to a format we understand. Then the proxy has a web uh, socket connection to our infrastructure. So we basically do a reverse proxy of uh, query stuff for your infrastructure. Um, so in that case, we do actually run Wasm plugins. But for the operational transform stuff, the, the Rust code is compiled directly into our API server uh, Rust backend. I think we're out of time as well. Almost. Any yeah, last questions? Thanks a lot.